go ahead with the overview of QGP props then. So, Yushan, okay. go ahead. I hope people can hear me clearly. I can um, hear you, so I assume others as well. Okay, great. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, this is Ian, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk here about the QGB probes. And, okay. So here is the outline of what I will talk about. So first I will have a very quick like thousand feet view of the various probes of QGP, like what are the probes that people are looking at. And then the majority of the talk will be focusing on jets, because that's uh, one of the, uh, the, the big subjects that uh, the, the Jetscape collaboration is involved in. So we will talk about jets, the constituents, the, the uh, some jet properties like substructure and so on. And then finally, some notes about jets at lower center of mass energy. And how we can learn about it. Okay, so let's start with the heavy ion collisions. So Julia has already uh, described a lot about the, the basics of heavy ion collisions. And here I will just uh, mention very briefly, like this is an example event of uh, heavy ion collisions at LHC. Uh, this is the left collision. And we can see that there is a huge amount of particles that's created. So each yellow line here is one charged particle. And there are also the neutral particles that's not typically not plotted as lines on these plots. So there are really a lot of particles. And most of these lines form uh, what we call the bulk of the collision which is the, all the uh, correlation and other things that Julia talked about uh, previously. And sometimes if we look at uh, the particles, uh, we can see that there are some special objects that we can, we can identify. So in, in this case, for example, uh, we see that there are two high energy electrons that's in the event. And uh, these things are based uh, uh, examples to, of what we call probes. <coughs> and in addition to leptons, we can also think of a number of very, various different things that we can look for in heavy ion collisions. That's relatively rare. Uh, for example, uh, high energy photons, uh, heavy quarks, bottom electron, and quarkonia, cuckoo bar. And sometimes people even look for exotic particles, the XYZ particles. And we can also look for top. And of course, there's also jets that people are uh, studying. And all of these uh, can be, uh, uh, we can try to identify in the heavy ion collision. So, uh, he, sorry, but there has been some question about uh, the position of, should, of your microphone. Maybe you can um, put it a bit different such that we can hear you more clearly. Uh, I try to speak closer. Does this work better? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I guess. I'm not sure if that's comfortable, but <laughs> maybe you can. Yeah, it would be good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'll see how, how far I can go. And uh, so what's uh, very interesting about these uh, high uh, particles is that if a particle itself is uh, sufficiently high energy, then they are mostly created from the initial collision in the heavy ion collision. And if it's uh, coming from the initial collision, then we can think of this as kind of a scattering experiment. So we have the heavy ion uh, high energy particle created, and then the QGP is formed around it. So the, the particle essentially goes through the QGP. And from these, we can use these particles to probe uh, what's happening with the QGP and vice versa in some cases. And so I'll try to define uh, what, what I mean by probes. So the probes is essentially uh, some special identifier or objects that we can use to study the quark-gluon plasma. And in the following few pages, I'll give some examples that people are looking at. 
So first, <coughs> first example is high energy photons and leptons. So here, uh, let's focus on the high energy here so that uh, we're sure it's created at an initial collision. So if we go to very low energy, then it's a completely different story. Then we get thermal photons and all the other stuff. stuff. But at high energy, they are mostly created at initial collision. And, and so here is an example of the nuclear multiplication factor RA is a plotted as a function of the photon transfers energy. So the uh, RA is defined as the cross-section with quark-gluon plasma, in this case, let it, divided by cross-section without quark-gluon plasma, which is the reference in PP in this case. And we can see that the RA is compatible with one, meaning that at least for high energy photons, there is little to no suppression at all. In other words, the quark-gluon plasma is transparent to high energy photons. And even though I didn't show it, the same is also true for high energy muons and electrons. Now, um, how about heavy quarks? So most, uh, in this case, uh, charm, for example. So most charm quarks are created at an initial collision because they're heavy. And so uh, once they are created, they're sampled through the whole evolution of the quark on plasma before combining with some light quark to form a meson at some later time. And by studying the charmed mesons, for example, uh, we can probe different types of fluctuations between initial state and the QGP interaction based. And this is a nice measurement that I will not go uh, further into details. If people are interested, I can explain further. And this just serves as an example of what people are looking at. And another interesting point about uh, charm is that inside the QGP, it goes through a diffusive process. And so the, you can think of the heavy quark is kicked around by the quark on plasma. And so if we uh, can say something about the diffusion coefficient, it's also linked to the jet quenching that we will discuss later. Okay. So uh, if we go up in complexity, then we have the quarkonia. So here we focus on the CC bar and BB bar pairs or J sign epsilon. So what makes these interesting is that the different states have different binding energies. And so they have different dissociation rate inside the QGP. And so typ typically excited states have weaker binding and they are more easily destroyed by the quarkonia plasma. And this is, uh, in fact, the main consider driving consideration of the so-called sequential melting picture. So the excited states are more suppressed compared to the, the less excited states. Uh, so you can see there is a hierarchy here for the Upson states. And since the turnout of the LHC, however, it's also uh, becoming clear that the other direction is important. There's not only dissociation, but there's also recombination. And this is a more so for JSI because they are more C created, uh, charm created in the collision. And since there are enough C and C bar created in the collision, there is some chance that a C will randomly find a C bar at some point in time, and they will recombine to a JSI. And this will reduce the amount of apparent suppression that we see. So RA will go up the more this happens. And so uh, the exact value of RA here that we measure here is a combination of many effects. And it's a very, very, uh, very imp uh, interesting input for theories. Okay, then we can also take uh, what we learned from Quarkonia and apply simpler, similar ideas to exotic states. Okay. So for example, people have studied the so-called X particle uh, in recent years. And in this case, it's the X3872 particle. And this particle is discovered about 20 years ago in B factories. And to this date, the exact nature is still not entirely clear. So there are some leading hypotheses include a molecule formed by a D and D bar mesons. So they are loosely bound and it's a molecule-like state or it can also be some sort of compacted tetraquark state. 
And depending on what this is, they have very different uh, physical size. So the molecule is expected to be very, very large. And also the binding energy will be very different. And so by studying the production rate in heavy ion collisions, we can gain some extra information on the nature of the state, which is not uh, accessible uh, in, by other means. And in this case, the, the role is actually reversed. So we are using the coagulum plasma to probe the state, uh, the nature of the state, which is quite interesting to, to see. Uh, finally, the, the other example I want to mention is the top quark. And as we all know, it decays very fast, and it decays much faster than uh, QGB formation. And so if we can reconstruct the top quark, we can use it to probe the initial state if the top is at rest. Uh, for example, the cold nuclear effects that uh, Julia discussed. And there are also many possibilities with boosted tops if once we have a lot more data. And the interesting about this is that um, the decay chains start to have more and more overlap with the QGP due to time dilation effects. And it's interesting to study how things will be modified uh, once we have access to, to those. Okay, so for a brief summary on this part before I dive into jets. Uh, so probes are special objects that we can use to understand the coagulum plasma or vice versa in some cases. And the very high energy ones above a few tens GV, for example, are generally created in the initial collision and they propagate through QGP. And this is how uh, we can study the interaction. Okay, so let's see if there are any quick questions. Don't see any I haven't chat. seen anything on the chat, no. Uh, but if anyone wants to come up with something, maybe this is a good moment to clarify things on this first part. Yeah, if there are any uh, quick questions, otherwise uh, I'll move on. Uh, yeah, we can and then we'll, we can come back in the, in the end as well. So I think you just move on and then we'll see. Great. So uh, let me move to the next part, which is uh, I will start to dive into jets and I will focus on light jets. Uh, so jets formed from uh, light quarks and gluons. And the heavy quark jets are also very interesting, but due to that we only have one hour, I will not go into the uh, what happens there. Okay, so uh, as a brief reminder, uh, if we have a highly virtual quark or gluon, or sometimes we, we call them protons, and because they are highly virtual, they will uh, tend to split repeatedly to decrease the virtuality. And what happens is that uh, the quark or gluon will shower into a spray of final particles that's going in roughly the same direction. And this spray of particles is what we detect in the experiments and we call them jets. So essentially jets are proxy for the initial quark of gluon. And now the very interesting question is, if we take this whole process and we immerse it into quark -gluon plasma, and what will happen? So what, we know, what do we know about it so far? And uh, this is an example of how it looked like in an actual event. So you can see that there are jets uh, picking out of a lot of energies scattered all around coming from the decay of the quark -gluon plasma itself. Okay, so back to jets. So first of all, we can again measure the nuclear multiplication factor, <coughs> which is again, the cross-section with quark -gluon plasma divided by cross-section without quark -gluon plasma. So in this case, uh, we build it from heavy ion collision divided by PP collisions. And, and what we see here is that at low en jet energy, uh, up to very high jet energy, up to one TeV, there is a relatively strong suppression overall. 
So it goes from 0 0.3, 0 0.4 in the low end, all the way up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 at the high end. So even at for one TV jets, about a third of the jet is gone after uh, you go through the Qualcomm plasma. And this phenomena is what we call uh, jet quenching. Let's say jets are disappearing. And uh, a similar thing we can also be seen uh, if we look at just the charged particles, not the jets, uh, but the, the single particles. And the spectra here is also strongly suppressed. Okay, so then the, the next question is, are the jets just disappeared or do they, uh, the energy changed and because of spectra shape, it looks like uh, uh, there's a suppression. And the way to establish if the jet energy has changed, uh, one of the ways is to look at topologies where a photon of Z is back to back uh, with the quark of Wuhan. So before going to uh, QGP, the momentum will be roughly balanced. It's a hot process and it's back to back. So it's roughly balanced. And however, after going through QGP, the photon or Z momentum will be remain the same because they are electroweak objects. But we can then see what the jet uh, energy is to see if there's any, uh, if that energy is changed by comparing to photon and Z. Okay, and this is all we see. So on the, this plot here, uh, what's plotted is the jet momentum divided by Z momentum in this case. And the red is what we see in PP collisions, the reference. And the blue is what we see in uh, heavy ion collisions. And we can see clearly that the mean of the distribution drops uh, from red to blue. And this established that just are in indeed losing energy on average. Okay, then we can also uh, look at other things, for example, the radial distribution of the jets. So the, here we try to measure uh, how the momentum is distributed as a function of distance to the jet. So we measure the momentum density as a function of distance. And first of all, uh, we can see that the energy is in jets are concentrated in a small area on average. So even if you go up to 0 0.2, it already contains a lot of most of the momentum. However, if we look at the log scale plot to focus on the tail here, we see that the, there's a much larger tail observed from jets in heavy ion collisions. So in other words, we observe that energy is pushed away from the jets as a result of interaction with the QGP. <clears throat> and one related uh, measurement that I think is interesting is to look at the correlation between the Z and the hadron. So in this case, we identify a Z and we look at the delta phi distribution uh, to, uh, to the other particles in the event. So on the left here is the, what happens in peripheral events. So we can see that the leadlet and PP collisions uh, have this, uh, this shape and the rise here is because uh, because of the uh, jet, because most of the events with the Z has a jet balancing on the other side. So we see when the open angle is pi, it means that these are particles coming from the jet. And then there are some other random particles that's in the event. Okay, and uh, what's happening in lead lead and PP are very similar in the peripheral case where the QGP effect is small. But if we now turn our attention to central events, we start to see a different picture. So the overall fish feature is still there. We still see a jet peak and there's a flat-ish uh, uh, component. However, in this case, we see an enhancement of particle uh, in the heavy ion case compared to PP case across the board, no matter what the opening angle is. So even in the direction of the Z, we still see some enhancement. And this is very interesting to look at. Okay, and another thing that uh, we can study is the how the 
momentum distribution of the particle is inside the jets. So this is what typically we call the fragmentation function. And it's plotted in this uh, weird C variable, but essentially it's uh, the momentum fraction carried by the particle. So zero here means that 100% of the jet momentum is carried by the particle. One here means that 30% is carried by that particle and so on and so forth. And here we compare the reference, uh, which is proton proton collision with the laser collision in blue. And we see a very striking difference. And essentially in lead lead, in blue, we see a lot of more soft particles inside the jets. Okay, so what happened uh, after seeing all these measurements? So a picture has started to emerge, which is that uh, what, when we have a high, highly virtual quark gluon, it will evolve. And during the evolution, it will interact with the QGP because it's, it's everywhere. And due to this interaction with the QGP, the energy is transported away from the jets. And because the jets have a finite size, it will seem that the energy is lost. It goes outside the, the collection area of the jets. And also at the same time, we see a lot more low energy particles because also because of the interaction with the, with the QGP. Okay, and this actually uh, begs the question. Since we know that the jets uh, energy are moving away from the jets, if we enlarge the jet size, uh, is there a chance that we can missing, recover the missing cross section? And this is what uh, people measure. So what they measure is the RA ratio between large jets and small jets. So if the ratio is less than one, it means that large jets are more suppressed. And if the ratio is greater than one, it means that large jets are less suppressed. And so what do we see? We see that it's almost, exact, almost exactly at one. And so what we observe is that even for large jets, we see a very similar amount of suppression. And this is a, actually a very interesting result because from the earlier discussion, we expect things to, to move up, like large jets should be less suppressed because we can recover energy. And in order to understand this result, we actually need to think a little bit harder of what we actually measure. So there are different types of jets. So uh, because the proton shower process is randomized, so some of them naturally evolve into skinny jets where everything is close to each other. And some of them naturally evolve to wider jets where things are more spread out. And we have to think what happens in these two cases. So if the evolution itself is small, you know, it's, uh, it's very collimated, then using a small radius jet, we will capture mostly by the small area. And for this part, uh, this type of jet, if we enlarge the jet size, indeed we, sh we should see energy recovery. Because it's small in the beginning and it's spread out uh, to larger size and we should see it. However, there's uh, another side of the story, which is that some jets are naturally large. And what happens here is very different because if we use a small air, uh, jet size to try to capture it, we will not capture it because it's large. And so for the small radius uh, measurements, this type of jet will not enter. However, when we enlarge the jet size, we suddenly we will detect these part of, this type of jets, but they also lose energy. And so this type of jets will uh, increase the amount of apparent suppression uh, when we go to larger radius. And so the, the take home message is that uh, in order to understand any result re, uh, related to jets, we need to think of what type of jets are we capturing with the measurements. And it's very important to keep that in mind in order to make sense of anything. And so the flip side of this is actually a little bit dangerous. Uh, it also means that we only see less modified jets. So suppose we have 
uh, two jets. One of them interacts like crazy with the quark-gluon plasma, and one of them doesn't interact that much. Then for the ones that interact a lot, uh, energy will be very spread out, and either we won't see it, or we will detect it as low energy. <coughs> and however, for the ones that doesn't interact much, we will detect it with high energy. And this is what is usually known as the, as the survivor bias or selection event effect from some people. They, they mean the same thing. And so I think moving forward, it's uh, very important uh, to keep this in mind and also try to co control the population. So one of the way to reduce the effect of survival bias is by looking at special topologies, for example, gamma Z plus jets. And in this case, one, since we already have a photon or a Z on one side, we can loosen the jet selection on the other side. And this loosened jet selection will decrease the effect of the survival bias and making the result more e easier to interpret. Okay. So uh, as a summary of the part one of the jets, so the jets are suppressed that we see, and the energy is pushed away from the jets to very far away. Uh, secondly, jets are a collection of very diverse things, and the jet population is very important to understand the results. And uh, to move forward, we need to think of ways to reduce the survival bias, otherwise the it's going to be very hard to understand things. <clears throat> okay, I don't see anything in the chat, so maybe let me move forward for now. Ah, I see a question from Wenbin. Uh, uh, Wenbin which asks uh, what type of jet is naturally large? Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, there's no special uh, configuration where it's large. It's more like uh, it's a random process. So you will get some small ones, some large ones. And uh, if you go back to the initial part on, then they all look the same. But after evolving, some will be small and some will be large. And we need to think of them separately. So there was also a question on Slack, which maybe we can address, or you can address now as well. Um, this is about if the jets, after interacting with the quark and plasma, are still infrared and collinear safe. Um, I don't think I get the, so it's about the infrared collinear safety of the- Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess if the algorithms that you use for jet reconstruction are still good if you have a quark gluon plasma present. I mean, that's how I interpret that question. Maybe <laughs> the person yeah, can- Yeah, I think the, say. yeah, I'll attempt to answer. So the, uh, uh, these types of safety is more a uh, uh, property of the algorithm itself and let a bit less so on what we apply it on. So I think this it's oh I I see a raised hand maybe Richard wants to say something on yeah this. I, I agree with what uh, what he just said and I just want to add that um, you know even if you take it out of the algorithm and just go into the calculation of, of a jet observable the the medium does not introduce any splits that are divergent, right? So it's actually, you know, you, you do get an additive term that comes from the medium to all the splitting functions, but it does not increase their infrared or collinear divergence. So things remain safe, even in the medium for jets. Okay, so you by hand, uh, I mean, introduce the splittings that are still collinear and infrared safe, right? Not, not by hand. I don't like the word by hand. Uh, I, okay. calcul I calculate the change in the splitting function due to scattering. And when you calculate, you find that it gives an additive contribution to the splitting function, which is not infrared uh, um, divergent or collinear divergent. I see. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. 
I think then looks to me as least as if you can move on for your next part of the talk. <clears throat> okay, so then let me move on to the next part. So the next part is still about jets. And so let us try to go further and see what other information we can extract from jets. And uh, the key observation here is that particles are not uniform inside jets. And uh, in fact, there is a lot of information encoded um, in how particles are distributed inside the jets. And all we need to do in some sense is to dig them out and try to learn something from them. So uh, for example, we can hope to infer what happens during the short revolution from the distribution of particles. And uh, there are many ways that we can try to look inside the jets. And so broadly speaking, there are uh, these different types of class of the observables. And so the, the first one is the class of observables built from the quote unquote grooming algorithms. So the grooming algorithm uh, attempts to clean up jets and isolate the large scale structures of the jets. Then uh, on the other side of the spectra, there is also the reclustering approach. So in this approach, uh, we try to find mini jets inside bigger jets and study how the mini jets behave. And then there are also a bunch of others that don't fall into one of these categories. Uh, for example, uh, jet angularity, equiplanarity, jet charge, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, let us first look at an example where we cluster mini jets inside a bigger jet. So in this case, the bigger jet is with R0.4, and the mini jets are with, done with R0.1. And uh, for this example, we measure the distribution of momentum fraction carried by the mini jets. So a Z equal to one means that all the momentum for the big jets is carried by the mini jets. And 0.7 means that 70% is carried by the mini jet. And uh, what is interesting about this approach is that we can gain access to the high Z region where all the jets momentum is concentrated in a small area. And this is not accessible uh, if you look at, for example, single particle fragmentation function, uh, which is the momentum fraction carried by the individual particles inside the jets. And so by looking at these mini jets, uh, we can gain extra information in addition to the more traditional fragmentation function of the groups. <coughs> okay, now let's turn our attention to another method to look inside the jets, and it's called the grooming algorithm. So as I explained before, the idea is to clean up the soft parts of the jets and then isolate the large scale structures. And for example, in this case, in this cartoon, the small particles in red will be cleaned up and then we, will, we are led with the blue ones, which is the large scale structures. And these can then be used as proxy to the shower evolution. So uh, what I mean by proxy is as follows. So suppose we are able to follow the evolution of a highly virtual problem uh, in this very simplified picture. So in the beginning, it's just one particle. And then at some point it was split into two and we have a two particle system. And then at some point, one of them will split again and we have a three body system. And it keeps going until we have the full jet. And it, it would be nice uh, to study these different stages by, one by one. Okay, and the first case here is just a full jet. And at least con conceptually, it's not very complicated. And how about other cases? And this is where the grooming algorithm comes in. So from the distribution of the final particles, uh, for example, in this case, uh, we can try to infer what happens uh, during the showering. And uh, some study has been done and we found that there's a rough uh, correspondence between uh, these uh, groups of particles in the final state versus what happens in the shower uh, process. And by studying the final state with the grooming algorithms, we can try to learn something about the shower process. 
And now let's go into specifics. So there are many, many, many grooming algorithms on the market. And one specific example <coughs> that's uh, pretty popular in recent years that I will discuss is called the soft crop grooming. So the algorithm goes as follows. First, it performs recombination from all the particles inside the jet to build this uh, binary tree structure. So essentially what it does is uh, it does a pairwise recombination in a greedy manner. So it finds the closest pair, combine them, and then repeat until everything's merged. And then we look at this uh, structure and examine the pairs as, uh, or splittings, uh, as some of us uh, uh, say, and then find a splitting that satisfies the so-called soft drop condition. And the soft drop condition contains uh, uh, two free parameters that one can tune to have uh, different strengths of grooming. Okay, and uh, to put it more graphically, this is how it looked like. And suppose on the left-hand side, this is part of the binary tree that we just built. And different nodes here different, denote different splittings or different pairings. And each pair, uh, we can identify two uh, numbers. One is the momentum sharing Z, like how balanced they are between the two, and also the opening angle between the two. And then which we can plot all of them on this plot. And the soft drop condition essentially defines a region of phase space on this plot. So uh, as one example is this black box here that's defined by the soft drop algorithm. And so if the splitting is inside this range, it's selected by the grooming. And if it's outside, it's, it's ignored. And so in this case, uh, first we have uh, the black uh, splitting that's outside the range. So we move on to the red one. It's still outside the range. And then we move to the green one. It's inside the range. So this is the splitting we select as the grooming. And so essentially, it's a phase-based cut on this Z delta R. Uh, space. Okay, so uh, if this is your first time seeing this, uh, don't worry if you cannot remember all the details here. So the main takeaway here is that a soft drop uh, algorithm is a class of algorithm, and different parameters correspond to uh, parameter settings correspond to different phase space that we probe inside the jet, and then we can look at different. Uh, pieces of this space space to study things that are separate. Okay, and uh, people have studied many different uh, soft drop settings, and uh, each box here corresponds to a different soft drop phase space cut that each of the settings probed. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are also a few more that I didn't put here for the sake of clarity. And now let's see what we can learn from all of these things. Okay, so first, uh, let's look at what happens to these two block boxes. So we have the purple box and we have the green box, which is all, all these ranges. And we can measure the momentum sharing, ZG. So the ZG is essentially the PT fraction carried by the soft uh, of the two harder structures. So if the ZG is small, it means that things are unbalanced. And if ZG is large up to 0 0.5, it means that the, the two structure is balanced. So we measure how balanced things are uh, for these two settings. Okay, and so what do we see? So here, the red points are the lead less collision and it's compared with the PP collisions in blue. And on the left is for the smaller drip radius, 0 0.2, and on the right is for the larger 0 0.4 radius. And they correspond to the purple and green boxes in the previous page. And what we see here is that there is no apparent modification. So for both of these settings, we do not see anything in particular regarding how balanced things are. Okay, so now, uh, how about we widen up the phase space and include some uh, phase spaces with, with lower Z. In other words, what, is, is, what will happen for this red box? And the cases we just saw 
are indicated as dashed boxes here. So we are in including some extra phase space in the lower Z region. And again, we measure the momentum sharing. And this is what we see. So the left-hand side plot is for peripheral events where the QGP effects are expected to be small. And we see that the distribution are compatible with the uncertainty between LED and PP. You see this ratio is compatible with one. And but that, that is for peripheral collisions. So how about the central collision? And here we, we start to see some modifications. So specifically, if we look at here, at large CG region, there's a relative suppression of the balance configuration. In other words, after interacting with QGP, the hard structures are becoming less balanced on average. Okay, great. So we see some interesting comparison uh, for different settings. So now how about some other observables like open, opening angle? So again, let's start with the purple and the green boxes. And if you remember for the uh, how balanced things are, they don't show any sign of modification. And here we measure the opening angle between the two. And here is the result. And a surprise for the opening angle, we do see some differences. And this is true for both the purple and the green boxes. <coughs> so on the left, we can see that uh, the distribution for smaller charge jets with R0.2. And the ratio between lead and PP shows a slope indicating that after quagrum plasma, we see that things are more narrow in general. And this is also seen in the case of full jets with R0.4 on the right. So here analyzers plotted RA directly, but the, the overall message is very similar. We see that large angle jets are more suppressed. You can see the downward slope here, which is similar to this. So for these two cases, the momentum sharing for these jets are not modified, but the opening angle is modified. And there are also uh, some other uh, phase-space selections that people have measured, but the overall message is similar that I, I don't share here. Finally, uh, how about the invariant mass of the hard structures? In other words, how heavy is the thing? So the invariant mass is uh, calculated by adding up all the four vectors of the individual particles in the, in the hot structure, and then we measure it. And here I will show two examples, which is the red box again, and also the orange dotted region. And uh, here we see something interesting again. So for the orange box, which is this dotted region, which overlaps a lot with the red boxes, and we do not see any significant modification. So in LED and PP, they all look very similar. However, for the red one again, uh, this uh, rectangular shape one, we do see uh, some hints that the mass is increased. So if we look at the mean of the red and the blue, there's a small shift. And I think it's very interesting to note again that with different soft drop settings, we're probing different parts of the phase space inside the jets. And depending on where we look, we can see very different things and learn more about jets. Okay, and so here is the overall situation of what we learned so far from different boxes. So I try to summarize the main findings for each of the boxes here. So for these <coughs> higher boxes, we typically see the opening angle is smaller and then the, there's no significant change for the momentum sharing. However, for the red box, we see that the momentum, uh, the hot structure is less balanced and there's a hint of larger mass as well. And so this is a little bit complicated. So I try to summarize by pointing out the biggest feature. So I think the, the biggest feature that we see so far from all these measurements is that up here, the surviving population, jet population is narrower. And there's something in the bottom right here that's responsible for the ZG and mass multiplication. Okay, 
And there are also a lot of other measurements that I don't have time to go into here. So there's angularity, echoplanarity, dynamical grooming, or how this KT splitting, jet charge, and so on and so forth. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to discuss more offline if people are interested in any of these. So as a summary of the part two of the jets, there's a lot of information encoded inside jets. And there are many different ways that we can look inside to gain more information. Uh, that those include reclustering, uh, which is the mini jets inside jets, uh, jet grooming, which is to look at the large scale structure of the jets. And these, uh, in some cases, can be proxy for hospitalizing during the showering. And then there are also many other observables. OK, uh, then maybe uh, we can see if there's any questions so far. Yeah, in fact, there was just a question on the chat um, that is, I think, quite interesting about how about jets in small systems? Uh, yeah. Uh, so jets in small systems is, is interesting in its own right. And so for, for this talk, I'm focusing on the QGP case, so large system case. So I didn't talk much, much about small system. And so the, the interesting thing about this is that, as you heard from Julia, there are a lot of signs of QGP-like effects in many of the other observables. But whenever we look at jets itself, we do not see any signs of jet crunching so far. And so this is a, a puzzle in, <coughs> in some sense because the different observables are showing different uh, cases, uh, different uh, apparent interpretation. And I think future studies like the oxygen oxygen collisions can can shed light on on some of these. Yeah, I think that's the status for now. So um, then we have one on Slack. Why the QGP interaction makes the vertices less balanced, so smaller z? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about this corner is that uh, it also corresponds to where the QGP effect is the strongest. So some of these effects is actually uh, fluctuations in the in the QGP response that happens to be picked up as by the grooming algorithm because the grooming is those is those uh, weak hit there. So it's it's a combination of uh, different things which include not only the the proton splitting but also what happens in nearby for the QGP response. So I think that's the, the main driving force uh, for the, uh, the difference here. Yeah, I'm not sure if that question was really about this plot, but maybe the person can say if that was the answer to the question. Yeah, or I not. think it's this plot, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we have one more. Um, most observables seem to focus on energy momentum characteristics of the jet. Is there any observables that is able to probe where the hard parton which originated the jet was created in the medium? So I guess it's about, can you find an observable that, that tells you something about the location or the origin of the hard parton that created the jet inside the core fluent plasma? Uh, yeah, so the, they are, there are a few things that uh, I assume the location refers to the initial location. Like yeah, where that's how I understand the question, yeah. Yeah, so there are a, a class of observables that's sensitive to path length dependent effects. For example, we can measure jet V2 and those other things. And recently also there are some machine learning approaches to try to pinpoint the, the location of the initial, initial scattering. So I would say that uh, before investigating it, and there, there are a lot of interesting work going on. Okay, are there further questions? Okay. I don't think so. So how much more do you have? Uh, a couple more slides. This is a very short section. Okay, a couple might work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so what about jets at lower center of mass energy? 
uh, in other words, at RIC, because so far I've uh, focusing on LHC. So uh, <coughs> what makes the lower energy jets interesting is that the QGP effects are ex expected to be quote unquote more visible when the energy of the quarkle gluon is closer to the QGP. So an analogy is that if you are throwing a bowling ball onto a bunch of pins, if you are, you are throwing a very heavy ball with very high energy, then what will happen is that it will just go through the whole thing. And there will be small deflection that we can try to study. But if on the other hand, we throw a very light ball with a smaller speed, then what happens will be very different. So it will bounce around and it will be more sensitive uh, to the, how the pins are arranged in the first place. And it's also very important to study the lower energy jets, especially in, in RIC. Uh, so as an example here, uh, what's plotted on the y-axis is the, again, the relative suppression of large radius jet to smaller radius jet. And what we have seen uh, before in part one of the jet correspond to these two blue points at high energy. So the conclusion there is that at high energy, we do not see much on uh, jet size dependence. <coughs> However, if we go to low energy, there are different measurements. And there's a green one, which is the measured by Atlas, which uh, the RCP measurements. And the apparent conclusion that one can draw is that the large radius jets are less suppressed over here at high, lower energy. However, recently there's a new measurement, preliminary measurement from Alice, which are these purple points. And the message uh, is a little bit different, which says that the large radius jets appears to be more suppressed compared to lower radius jets. So there is some tension between the different measurements. And once we have more rig data, uh, we will fill in this part and it will be very important input to, to understand this tension. And we're also in the very exciting times and there's a lot more data that's coming soon. First of all, we have a lot more data from STAR that's collected and will be collected. We also have the data from the new s detector that's coming online next year. And so in the coming years, this rig section will probably change a lot. And I invite you to stay tuned. Okay, so uh, to conclude, so um, some word on moving toward the future and kind of advertisement. So with the proliferation of results, uh, how to coherently interpret them become, becomes more and more important. And this is a really a case for wider adoption for Bayesian techniques and there were others related techniques. And please join the Bayesian sections next, next week to learn more about these. Okay, so as a summary, uh, the probes are special objects we can use to understand the QGP. There are some examples I show, and there are also many others. Then jets uh, evolve from highly virtual quarkle gluon. They are suppressed, and the energy is moving away from the jets. There is also a lot of information inside the jets uh, where we can study the substructure of the jets. And finally, jets at risk complements the LHC measurements, and there will be a lot more data coming soon and more results. So that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yi. So we finished uh, well on time, so we still have a few minutes for questions. Um, so if anything you still want to know, that's the chance. You can also just raise your hand if you want to speak up or you put it in the chat, which is easier to see for me at least in the Slack channel, but all is okay. We'll try to monitor. Yeah. If, but maybe yeah, maybe um, many questions have been asked now, so I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I think if there are more questions, people are, are welcome to add in, in, in Slack even after the talk. Then yeah, that's a good point. I mean, so if something yeah, comes yeah. comes up that you figure in a few hours from now, you can still ask on the on the Slack channel, and the people will try to get back to you to answer.
Okay. So if there's nothing more at this point, then I think we should thank all the speakers of today's sessions and uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day or good evening, good night, wherever you are. And uh, then the school continues tomorrow again. <laughs>